Good evening and welcome. I'm Jeff Spence from the alumni office in Thomas Jefferson University, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this evening's webinar. Thank you for joining us as uh, you hear from Dr. Jenna Ryder, uh, an assistant professor of psychology in Jefferson's College of Humanities and Sciences. This evening in our talk, um, we will learn how stress and trauma impact us both psychologically and physiologically, and how your body is affected by stress and learn some coping me mechanisms and strategies that you can use to reduce and manage its effects. So with that, it's my pleasure to welcome our speaker, Dr. Ryder. Dr. Ryder, welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Jeff, for the introduction. And thank you all so much for coming tonight. I'm just gonna share my screen now. So stress is something that's always been a problem in our modern world, but I think everyone agrees that it's gotten considerably worse in the last couple of years. In fact, the American Psychological Association, which puts out a report about stress in America every single year, actually declared in 2020 that there was a national mental health crisis, one that would have consequences for years to come. And in their most recent report, which was in October of 2021, they reported that nearly a third of American adults were so stressed about the pandemic that they had difficulty making decisions, even about basic everyday things. You can see the breakdown here by generation and the largest impact was on young adults, but really every generation had a significant portion of people endorsing this super high stress level. And this doesn't necessarily encompass people who might feel also super stressed, but for reasons that are not strictly pandemic related. Given that so many people have been so profoundly impacted by stress, especially in recent times, it's important to understand how this can influence various aspects of health. So in this talk, I'm gonna describe how stress impacts the body and contributes to health related problems. Towards the end, I'll also talk a bit about some strategies for reducing stress and mitigating this damage. Stress is a multidimensional concept. And what we often think about is the emotional component, like the experience of fear or anxiety and the cognitive component, thinking about what might go wrong in the future. But there can also be a behavioral component. Um, that could be something like pacing around or it could be outright avoiding something that you find stressful. And then there's the physiological response, which is what happens in your body. This physiological response is the link between stress and health. So I wanna focus on what happens physiologically when we are confronted with a stressor. One thing to note before I start is that the physiological systems I'm going to describe are found across a variety of, of mammalian species. They're considered evolutionarily old and they're designed to support the basic goal of survival. They are well suited to that purpose they can help you act quickly in an emergency situation. Um, unfortunately for us, they often lead to problems because many of us are eliciting the stress response frequently in the absence of any real emergency or threat to our lives. For example, instead of getting uh, stressed about a lion that is chasing us, we often get stressed about something like a text message. So regardless of what we are reacting to, whether it's a genuine emergency or some abstract social situation, the response in the body is pretty much the same. And it consists of two different stress systems. The first is the sympathetic nervous system, which is shown on the left. And the second is the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. I'll often call it HPA axis, which is shown on the right. So the sympathetic system is the first to respond and it becomes active almost immediately following the onset of a stressor. So as soon as you detect some threat or what you perceive as a threat in the environment, this system kicks in. It's often referred to as the fight or flight response and it underlies a lot of the sensations that you probably notice in your body when you're stressed. Like for example, maybe your heart racing. Those kinds of sensations happen pretty quickly but really the response begins in the brain in an area called the locus ceruleus. The locus ceruleus is a part of the brain that releases a chemical called norepinephrine, and it starts to release a lot more norepinephrine uh, when you're confronted with a stressor. 
This area of the brain, the locus ceruleus, it projects to or communicates with many different areas within the brain. So the norepinephrine signaling increases in a variety of areas, including parts of the limbic system, which we know are important in emotion. Eventually, some of these projections exit through the spinal cord and they synapse onto the peripheral nerves. Once in the periphery, the projection starts to impact various organ systems. And this is what causes the physiological changes and sensations that you notice. So your heart beats faster, your breathing gets quicker and more shallow. You might notice changes in temperature or start to sweat. All of these changes prepare your body to react in an emergency. This goal is also supported by changes in blood flow. So the heart rate is increased and the heart is pumping out more blood, but it's not doing so indiscriminately. It's being distributed in a selective manner. In some places, we see vasoconstriction, which is when your blood vessels become narrower. Um, imagine that you're driving on the highway and two lanes are closed on the four lane highway. It's gonna become a lot more congested, so movement is slower. As a result of vasoconstriction, most of the organ systems like the digestive system and the skin wind up receiving less blood. In other areas though, we see vasodilation. So vasodilation is when the blood vessels become wider so more blood can travel quickly. Vasodilation allows more blood to be pumped to the skeletal muscles so that you can use them to run away from danger. It especially goes to the lower limbs. Um, and that makes sense because unless you're super talented and can run on your arms, most of us run away using our legs. The main chemical output of this system is that neurotransmitter that I mentioned, norepinephrine, and a very closely related chemical, epinephrine. Maybe you haven't heard the terms norepinephrine and epinephrine before, but there's a good chance you do know these chemicals by their other names, which are noradrenaline and adrenaline. These chemicals are released from the adrenal glands, which are located right on top of your kidneys. Um, and again, all of this happens extremely quickly, such that levels of norepinephrine peak in the blood within just a couple minutes following a stressor onset. The sympathetic reactivity also starts to shut down pretty quickly, at which point the second stress system takes over. That system is the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal or HPA axis. The HPA axis is a lot slower, but it underlies a more sustained response. The system also begins in the brain in an area called the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus releases a hormone, which is called CRH, that stands for corticotropin releasing hormone, and it releases it onto the nearby pituitary gland. The pituitary gland responds by releasing its own hormone, which is called ACTH or adrenal corticotropic hormone. ACTH travels through the bloodstream really far all the way to the adrenal glands. Um, and finally, the adrenal glands respond by secreting the stress hormone cortisol, which you're probably familiar with. So for the purpose of this talk, there are three main things I wanna emphasize about the stress response systems. The first is their chemical outputs, and I'll talk more about the effects of these chemicals. The second is the different time courses of the two systems. So unlike the sympathetic nervous system, which is super fast, the HPA axis responds slowly. So cortisol levels don't peak in the blood until about 20 to 30 minutes following uh, the stressor onset. Cortisol levels also tend to linger for a bit longer. So the levels can be elevated in the bloodstream um, up to an hour and change or so after the stressor has already ended. Um, and finally, one other thing to know about the sympathetic nervous system is that this system operates in direct opposition to something called the parasympathetic nervous system. So if the sympathetic nervous system is turned on, the parasympathetic, uh, which is often called rest and digest, is turned off. Rest and digest or parasympathetic is basically responsible for all of the critical maintenance functions within our body. Things like tissue repair, food digestion, reproductive system function, things that we know are important for our health in general, but not super important when we're faced with an emergency. So if we are in a state of stress, we activate the sympathetic nervous system that helps us deal with the emergency, 
and parasympathetic function is suppressed. You really can't activate these two systems at the same time. Um, I kind of think of them like these two cute little puppies. They can't both have the stick, right? Like one of them is going to win and have the stick at least for a little while until the other one steals it back. So the sympathetic nervous system and HPA axis are important. They need to function effectively. That could be the difference between life or death in some scenarios. Again, though, the problem comes from the fact that these two basic systems are activated anytime we respond to a stressor, regardless of whether it is an actual threat or an actual emergency. Um, you know, an actual threat might be like, a car speeding towards you or a vicious apex predator coming to eat you. But we have the same response, even if it's something much more abstract and less immediately threatening. The body essentially treats all these different scenarios as the same. Um, and unfortunately, many of our modern day stressors are things that we encounter chronically. So we activate the stress systems frequently. That can lead to long-term problems. Um, and there are just so many physical and mental health concerns that relate to stress. Um, and this list is by no means comprehensive. Now, one thing to note is that I'm not saying that stress is the only cause of these, but I'm saying that stress is one of multiple factors that contributes to risk. And for people who already have one of these conditions, stress often increases symptom severity. I can't possibly talk about all of these, so I've suggested just a few health concerns to focus on. The ones I'm going to focus on are unwanted changes in weight, high blood pressure and cardiovascular problems, and immune uh, dysfunction. The first one, unwanted changes in weight, is not necessarily indicative of pathology or disease on its own, but this is an aspect of health that can contribute to risk for other conditions, and it's also one that can impact people psychologically. Unwanted changes in weight are often accompanied with a sense of guilt or shame and can negatively impact self-esteem. This is also a common concern recently for many people. Um, as the APA report I mentioned earlier also noted that a majority of American adults have said that they experienced unwanted weight loss or weight gain since the start of the pandemic. Um, and you can also see, again, the breakdown by various demographic factors, and you'll notice that the impact of this specific problem is, again, especially strong for young adults, but also for Hispanic Americans, for parents, and for essential workers. One obvious way that stress impacts weight, uh, weight changes, is by impacting eating behavior. We know from studies with both humans and also animal models that stress can underlie both hypophagia, uh, undereating, or hyperphagia, overeating. This can be true in the sense that different people might respond in opposite ways to stress, with some of them eating much more than usual and some eating less. About two thirds of people tend towards the overeating response when stressed, but a sizable minority of people will eat very little when stressed. And there's a couple reasons for this. One is simply that different stress-related chemicals have different effects on appetite. So for example, epinephrine, remember that's one of the outputs of the sympathetic nervous system, this tends to reduce appetite. Whereas cortisol, the output of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, tends to increase appetite. Even within the HPA axis itself, there is some variability. So the hormone CRH, that's what the hypothalamus releases, actually also reduces appetite. For most people though, cortisol winds up having the biggest influence. Um, and this is because remember that cortisol levels take a long time to peak and also a long time to go back down. That means they're often elevated long after a stressor has been resolved. There are also individual differences in HPA axis function, such that some people have a very strong HPA, HPA axis response to stressors. And it's these individuals who are most likely to overeat, specifically during times of stress. And ironically, this is even more likely for a person that normally makes some kind of conscientious effort um, to be deliberate about their diet most of the time. 
Um, and that's probably because stress interferes with our usual self-regulatory mechanisms. When we're feeling stress, we often permit ourselves to uh, kind of betray like what we would consider um, like our usual self-discipline, whatever we decide to be mindful and deliberate about. And there's another way that elevated cortisol can promote weight gain that actually has nothing really to do with eating or anything under voluntary control. Um, and it's that cortisol can bind to fat cells and cause them to take up more nutrients and put them away in their stored forms. This happens during stress recovery. That's when the stressor is already long gone, but cortisol levels are still elevated. This makes evolutionary sense because if you're recovering from a true emergency, like you just ran away from a lion, you probably want to have some energy stored away in case that lion comes back later. But this isn't great for us because um, remember, we're often stressed about mundane daily things, um, mundane things that happen frequently. That means our cortisol levels can wind up being elevated for much of the day because we're activating the stress systems before the stress recovery for the last silly thing we were stressing about um, is still impacting our cortisol levels. Um, so stress is you know, telling the fat cells to put more of these nutrients away as fat, which you know, many of us don't particularly want. And even more insidiously, cortisol tends to preferentially communicate with the fat cells located near our organs. That's what's called visceral fat. When you hear about excess fat being bad for health, um, it's actually specifically visceral fat that people are usually referring to. The other type of fat, subcutaneous fat, that's the fat directly beneath the skin. Um, that's the kind of fat that's more visible to us, but it's not really the type that contributes to more health problems. So unwanted weight change is a health concern that's mostly impacted by cortisol. Now I'm gonna talk about a set of problems that relate somewhat more to the sympathetic nervous system. And these are cardiovascular risk factors, things that increase risk for cardiovascular disease. One of them is hypertension or chronically high blood pressure. Every time you activate the stress response, the sympathetic system turns on, parasympathetic switches off, and you experience an increase in heart rate. The blood is pumped with greater force and it's preferentially directed to the limbs and you also have more blood going to the heart. When this happens on occasion, it's not an issue, but when it happens frequently, the blood vessels start to adapt in a way that's not great for our health. Um, so namely the blood vessels become thicker to withstand constant increased pressure that might sound like a good thing, like, oh, they're becoming stronger, but actually it means they're becoming less pliant or flexible. Because of this, there's more resistance and consequently the blood pressure needs to increase even further to push through the vessels. And when this becomes pronounced enough, a person has what we call hypertension, consistently elevated blood pressure. Another thing that can happen is due to the increased force, blood vessels can become damaged. This especially happens at bifurcation points. Bifurcation points are where a bigger vessel splits into some smaller ones, which happens many, many places uh, in your circulatory system. And when that damage occurs, cells of the immune system come over because they want to try to help. They want to try to help repair. These cells include things like foam cells and cytokines, which are chemical messengers. And although they are trying to help, these immune cells can create a blockage within the vessels. And they also form a sticky surface onto which circulating nutrients, including things like what we call bad cholesterol, can easily get stuck. And when that happens, it creates arterial plaque, another major risk factor for heart disease. And finally, one last health consequence that I wanna describe is immune dysregulation. Um, this is mostly the result of high cortisol, which among its many functions uh, does serve to reduce immunity. Specifically, cortisol reduces the production of lymphocytes or white blood cells, and it makes the ones that you already have less efficient at doing their job. Cortisol also messes with cytokines, which again are the chemical messengers of the immune system. As you can imagine, reduced white blood cell 
count and efficiency means your body is not as good at fighting off infections. Um, ironically, the consequence is that during a time when many of us are super stressed about not getting sick, our stress itself can actually make us more vulnerable to infections. And because of cortisol's effect on cytokines, the immune system can become dysregulated in other ways. That can increase the risk for things like chronic inflammation um, and even autoimmune conditions where the immune system attacks the body's own cells. Of course, no one wants to experience these negative effects. And um, one important strategy that we can use to protect against them, along with things like healthy diet and getting enough sleep, is trying to reduce our stress. There are many, many strategies that work, and sometimes different things are best for different people. But I'm going to talk about three strategies that have strong support in the empirical literature. So I'll talk about exercise, breathing techniques, and cognitive reappraisal. So for exercise, remember that when we activate the sympathetic nervous system, the body is primed to mobilize energy reserves, and the blood is preferentially directed to our muscles, especially in the lower limbs. This is great if you're gonna use that energy to run away from the tiger, or you have to escape from a burning building. Um, but there's sort of a mismatch between what the body is prepared to do, something like what I'm showing you here, um, versus what most of us are actually doing when stressed, um, probably something more like what you see on the right. We're often not doing anything particularly active. We might be sitting in one spot, maybe using a phone or computer, very much in our heads. One reason that exercise can be so effective is that you're not only you know, distracting yourself with a different activity, but you're also allowing your body to complete the task that it's prepared itself for. So really any type of exercise can be beneficial and, en and enhance health. Um, but when we're thinking about stress reducing impact in particular, we have to keep in mind that it is possible for exercise to become something of a hassle or a chore, um, you know, kind of becoming a stressor itself. So if you want the greatest amount of stress reduction, the best kind is really any physical activity that you enjoy, that you actually look forward to doing. Um, exercise can also help with some of the consequences of stress, like it can help to reduce something like hypertension. Breathing is another really simple but empirically supported strategy um, for reducing stress. And there are many different breathing techniques that can work, um, but I would describe all of them as like uh, types of essentially like more mindful, deliberate breathing. One thing that is encouraged is breathing from the diaphragm or deep belly breathing. That's really the way we're supposed to breathe but when we're stressed, we tend to breathe only from the chest and we aren't able to take in nearly as much oxygen. Um, in fact, some of us even have the habit of breathing only from the chest, like all the time. But when you breathe deeply using the diaphragm, you not only are taking in uh, more oxygen, but you're also stimulating the parasympathetic nervous system. Remember, that's the system that opposes the sympathetic nervous system. So when you trigger the rest and digest mode, fight or flight turns off. Um, another useful breathing strategy um, is to focus in particular on lengthening the exhales. This also stimulates the vagus nerve, which activates the parasympathetic system. And controlling the breathing has another benefit, which is simply that it requires mindfulness and attention. Focusing your attention on just one thing and being present during that task can reduce our tendency to worry about a whole laundry list of items. So what I like about those two strategies, exercise and mindful breathing, is that they don't require you to have a good attitude. You can be as grumpy as you want, but if you do them, they can still work. The last strategy that I will recommend, however, does require you to have an open mind or to change your attitude. And this strategy is called cognitive reappraisal. It's essentially reframing your initial assessment of a situation. This is important because people differ widely in their tendency to declare that a situation is stressful. Um, and most things that upset us are not exactly things that are universally regarded as stressful. 
So perspective matters. Cognitive reappraisal doesn't mean being delusional about a situation or like sticking your head in the sand. It's just a matter of framing things differently. So one shift in perspective that can be helpful in dealing with stressful situations is maybe to view things as less of a threat and more as something of a challenge. Say, for example, you have a job interview. You can worry that you might potentially mess up. You might say something really silly. You might be embarrassed. But you could also consider this as an opportunity to get a position that might be a great fit for you. This simple shift, shift in perspective can have implications for our mindset. As you can see in this chart, it's the difference between a situation being an opportunity for growth versus one for failure. And this is also uh, something that impacts our physiology. When you see something as more of a challenge versus a threat, your body tends to respond in a way that facilitates performance. And you experience more vasodilation. Remember that allows blood to flow more easily um, and you take deeper breaths with more oxygen. Now, depending on the situation, there are many other ways that you could shift your initial uh, appraisal or assessment of a situation. And one awesome thing about cognitive reappraisal is that this gets easier the more you do it, um, partly due to changes that actually happen in the brain in terms of brain function. So in summary, stress is kind of the worst thing ever. Um, it takes, tends to make all other problems worse. It feels awful and it can actually make us sick, um, especially if we allow it to take over our daily lives. We often can't control the things that happen to us or things in the world, but that doesn't mean that we are helpless. There are tools that you can use to mitigate the stress response. And at least two of the techniques that I've talked about are things that you can do anywhere and at any time. You don't need any special equipment. You don't need anything fancy. You just have to do them. That can be hard at first, but they can become more habitual and therefore easier over time. So thanks so much again for coming to this talk and for being open to learning about stress, why it matters, and how we can control it. Um, I'm happy to take any questions during this Q&A. Thank you, Dr. Ryder, for a very informative uh, chat. For those of you who would like to share some questions, you can do so by using the Q&A button located at the bottom of your screen. We did receive some questions in advance, which we'll, we'll go through as, as time allows. But yes, you can feel free to use the Q&A button to, to submit any questions. So Dr. Ryder, let's, let's get started with some of the questions that we received in advance. Um, a few really relate to stressors and, and how to best identify what are the, the stress causes sometimes, as, as you know, or they're not always what it appears to be on the surface. And do you know of any techniques that, that folks can use to really um, spend some time really identifying what is causing the stress? Yeah, so, I mean, I think you can address this on a number of levels. One could have to do with emotional processing. Um, sometimes uh, people might not be sure of exactly what it is they're feeling. And that can be even more likely for somebody who has a trait like alexithymia. Um, that's a personality trait where a person has difficulty with identifying their emotions. Like they know they feel bad, but they can't say specifically what it is. Um, and that's a trait that people vary along. So it's not like a clinical diagnosis, but a person can just kind of tend towards being a little bit more like that. Um, and if that's the case, more uh, targeted kind of emotional processing and thinking about what they are really feeling could be helpful. Um, it could also be useful for the person to keep some kind of log or like journal about how they're feeling day in and day out. And they can see if there are connections, like do they feel especially stressed in a certain environment? Do they feel stressed after a certain reoccurring event in their lives? Um, things like that. Um, the person could also note maybe patterns of not feeling so well, because um, that can also be linked to stress, and that could also help to kind of identify these patterns. Thank you. We have another uh, question asking, um, and, and if you know, about using tools like meditation um, for, for stress release. I'm sure there's some relation to deep breathing and, and such, but, but are you aware of some impact there? Yeah. So meditation is a great way to reduce stress. Um, 
you know, some breathing techniques can be a form of meditation, um, but other types of meditation don't necessarily involve focusing on the breath. What they do all involve, however, is focusing your attention on one particular thing. And that tends to quiet what you would call like the monkey mind, where you're just, you know, rattling off a million different things, uh, catastrophizing, thinking about all the ways that that your life can go wrong and that problems can lead to others. Meditation really changed, uh, kind of trains us to focus the mind in a more deliberate manner. Maybe somewhat related, we, we received some questions about um, your thoughts on taking breaks. So things like vacations, taking longer breaks from, from work or, or from other stressors in sort of temporary time, um, do you find long-term benefit or are you aware of long-term benefit um, to increasing those sort of breaks from, from that time period? Yeah, um, there are actually a number of studies, uh, some of which have been around for a while that do show that taking vacations, specifically like a vacation from work, is something that improves a person's self-reported stress and their well-being. There are some studies that also show links with cardiovascular effects like hypertension, but you know, the effects on self-reported stress are pretty robust. And what I think is really cool is that it doesn't have to be a long vacation. It could be something shorter, like just three or four days. And it doesn't have to be an exotic tropical getaway. Even people who were having a vacation within their own homes also showed these positive effects. But a tropical vacation doesn't hurt. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, another question that, that we received is really looking at um, when when managing stress becomes at times maybe overwhelming, what are some of the things that folks should look for when they might want to seek professional assistance, whether it be with a psychologist, with a psychiatrist? Yeah, so with managing garden variety stress, um, in most situations, you wouldn't necessarily need a psychiatrist. Um, you know, if somebody is dealing with something like PTSD, there are some pharmacological strategies for that. But most of the like anxiety reducing drugs are not necessarily things that are meant to be taken long term. Um, for a lot of anxiety and stress related conditions or normative iterations where a person just has some level of stress and anxiety um, can be treated with cognitive or behavioral strategies. So if a person is seeking uh, a therapist, they might look for cognitive behavioral strategies, somebody who practices those, um, you know, and that can be super helpful. You know, one type of cognitive behavioral approach to reduce stress can be breaking the cycle of avoidance. Um, often people avoid the things that really stress them out and that avoidance can be reinforcing. So a person gets stressed in some type of social situation, they avoid it. As they are, as they just dodge the work social gathering or whatever it is, they have this sense of relief. And that relief is something that positively re reinforces. Um, so they kind of continue with that behavior and they don't learn to tolerate the situations that they find distressful. Um, so CBT can be really effective. It can include uh, things like exposure therapy, where a person is confronting the things that normally stress them out that they might avoid. Um, it could also include processing different stressors, thinking about the way they feel, thinking about the way the person often copes with them, whether those coping strategies are effective, whether they can be replaced with something else, um, you know, all kinds of things. And I would say that you know, when it comes to like psychotherapy, really anybody who can afford and has access to this kind of resource can benefit from it. You don't have to have a full-blown clinical condition for that kind of help to be of uh, benefit. Very interesting, and thank you. We have another question, and I think you've, you've touched on it some throughout um, your talk, but do you have any general self-care tips really for maybe managing or being prepared to, to deal with stress? Yeah. So one thing that I'll say is 
you know, again, there are so many different coping strategies, different people seem to like some versus others. But where a lot of us run into problems is that we might perseverate on the coping strategies that we are most used to. Like there's no coping strategy that's always going to be the best, that's going to be helpful in every single situation. But what is most adaptive is having a flexible mindset, being willing to try different things and able to evaluate whether something is currently working. Um, you know, something might have worked in the past. It might work again in the future, but that doesn't mean that it's working right now. So just being flexible and open to different things is kind of the best way. Um, but if if you're asking about specific strategies that I really like, um, you know, in addition to things like exercise and physical activity, if you can do things outside, you kind of get a double benefit because you get the benefits of exercise as well as uh, there are benefits of simply being in nature. Um, studies have found that spending time in nature can actually reduce cortisol levels, it can reduce blood pressure. And if you think about that from something like the biophilia hypothesis, there is this idea that humans have this innate desire to want to connect with nature in some way, even though our societies are in many ways designed to keep us away from nature, we do kind of have this gravitation towards things that are alive. Um, even children show it, they often show a lot of interest in like animals or plants. Um, and as adults, we continue to want that connection with nature. So I really encourage like going outside when it's nice and stuff. That's great. I think it's more evidence for that tropical vacation. Um, just making sure you, you take a hike while you're there. Uh, we, we have a question in, uh, that, that's come in, but we also had some in advance that, that kind of connect to the, the same theme, which is really sort of the modern work style, the modern connectivity of sort of constant cell phone, constant social media, um, constant connection to work. Um, the question that we're receiving is really, do you, do you have ideas or maybe you things that you put in practice yourself of, of how folks can really disconnect? I'm sure you've seen somewhere that might cause more stress is to be disconnected. Um, and our alumnus, Steve, I will admit, has a great suggestion of dropping yourself under the toilet bowl. Um, but he wonders if there's a less expensive solution. <laughs> yeah, so here I'm definitely talking about ideas, not things that I do personally. I am not always great at, you know, this form of self-care. Um, but one thing could be to have a specific location that you designate as stress-free. For many people, a logical you know, place for that could be something like your bedroom. Um, so keeping things like your cell phone or computer outside of that space um, so that when you go into them, it's kind of this whole context in which you learn to start to calm down um, your brain, start to calm down your physiology, and you can transition into more of like a parasympathetic mode, um, you know, a state in which we can rest and restore our, you know, our maintenance bodily functions. And we have an, another question. And um, Mary, I hope I am understanding your question correctly. If not, please um, write into the Q&A box. Um, but Mary asks, what are some indicators or behaviors to prompt professional intervention? And I'm reading that as indicators or behaviors for um, to seek, again, psychological help from, from a professional. Um, or <laughs> Mary, if you meant in a professional setting, please type that in. But I'm, I'm taking it as, as medical or psychological pro professional. Yeah, I mean, so... There can be a lot of stress related health effects. So if a person notices anything really strange, like, I don't know, losing a lot of hair very suddenly or something else very severe, you would want to go see what whatever relevant doctor has that specialty. And if they can't find an underlying medical cause, then that could be something that prompts um, some kind of psychological support as well. Um, but in terms of behavior, I would say that it, it kind of depends on the person's life history, their developmental history. So if we're talking about somebody who is showing 
uh, trauma related symptoms like PTSD related symptoms, um, things that are starting to interfere with a person's life would definitely be strong signals that some type of, you know, professional assistance could be helpful. So if a person is so irritable or angry that they're starting fights with people at work, um, it's affecting their interpersonal relationships. Definitely something that they would want to sort out before this could kind of have disastrous consequences on their life. Um, but like one thing I'll say again is that you don't have to be on the far end of spectrum of symptoms to benefit from professional help. Really, anybody can benefit from that. Um, unfortunately, that's not always easily accessible. It's not always covered by insurance. Not everyone can afford it, et cetera. Um, so a good substitute sometimes, like it's not the same, but it can also be helpful is to seek social support, um, to let other people who you are close to know about what you're going through. Um, you know, instead of saying you're fine all the time, explaining when you can use some extra support, explaining what other people can do to support you. Um, yeah, that can be a, a good alternative or also a compliment, I think, to professional help. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, another question you, you touched during your talk about um, hypertension and the relation with, with stress. Um, one of our attendees is asking, um, can high blood pressure caused by stress be fully reversed or um, has damage been done, in, in, so to speak? Yeah, I mean, there are definitely case studies of that happening, of people who just completely don't have hypertension anymore um, as a result of usually a combination of like self-care, mindfulness techniques, and often exercise comes into play. Um, for a given person, you know, I can't really guarantee that it would work um, without any kind of other medical treatment. But for some people, it does seem to be enough just focusing on the stress. Um, you know, one thing that might determine this is so people can have high blood pressure for a number of reasons. Stress is definitely one big factor, but other factors can play a role as well. Some people have genetic risk factors. It could be related to diet. Um, so if somebody has like a lot of those other risk factors, just targeting the stress alone might not totally mitigate the problem. It would certainly help, I think. Um, but like, I can't guarantee that would always work for every person. Um, but it's probably always a good thing to have as part of the the treatment package. Hey, wonderful. Uh, we have a few minutes left. If there are any other additional questions that anyone would like to share, well, we can um, give a minute or two to, to let folks come in. And one of our attendees also shared um, from their professional opinion, just also looking at symptoms caused by anxiety, um, not just direct stress, can headache, abdominal pain, shortness of breath. Um, things like that to be an indicator that professional intervention <laughs> might be important. Okay. I'm not seeing any additional questions at this time. So if you do, you can feel free to email us in the alumni office and we'll be sure to share them with Dr. Reeder and, and get responses uh, from her. But with that, thank you so much, Dr. Reeder, for a really, really informative evening. And thank you to everyone who has joined I'd like to invite you to make sure that you uh, register and update your profile on the Jefferson Alumni Network at alumninetwork.jefferson.edu. And we have a number of upcoming programs, both online and in person. Um, on March 8th, we are, have a special presentation for International Women's Day, where we'll take a look inside Jefferson's textile and costume collection at some of our women makers and designers. Uh, we have a few events coming up in the Philadelphia area including limited tickets for an exclusive evening at the Harry Potter exhibit at the Franklin Institute, which is the hottest ticket in town. Uh, we will have a, an after hours talk and reception followed by exclusive access to that exhibit. And around the country, we are returning to in-person events and we'll be coming to an area near you. We will be spending uh, next week in uh, the East Coast, on the East Coast of Florida, with a special alumni reception with Chancellor Willie McHeather, uh, who is the campus chancellor for our East Falls campus. And next Saturday, we will uh, be at a spring training game in West Palm Beach if 
Major League Baseball cooperates with us. But until then, we want to thank you all for joining us. Hope to see you again soon. Please stay safe and have a wonderful evening. Good night.